Well, hey, friends, this is Heidi St. John. You guys have found me at my little corner of the internet. Today, I'm going to devote my entire show to talking about nonprofit statuses and their relationship to churches. I'm going to start by answering a question from a listener and lay out a reason why I really do believe that churches may need to rethink their nonprofit status. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, hey, everybody, I hope you're doing good today. Before I jump into the meat of my podcast, I want to thank you guys so much for listening to the show, for leaving reviews for it over at iTunes. We really appreciate it. This, Your reviews have really helped to catapult this show uh, into the top 100 podcasts for Christianity over at iTunes. So I thank you guys for that very much. I wanted to let you know that I am going to be in Downey, California at Calvary Chapel Downey, June 13th through 15th for the CHIA conference. That's the California Home Educators Association. I have been privileged to keynote there several times over the years, and I'm really looking forward to going down again. I'll be down there with several of my children and my husband. And so I hope you guys will come and and, uh, say hello. I love to hug your neck out on the road. I had a great time in Indianapolis just a few days ago uh, speaking at a fundraiser for the Indiana Homeschool Association, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about why I think it is so important that you begin to really get behind organizations like IAHE that are doing the hard work of maintaining your freedom in home education. Um, I believe people ask me all the time, you know, do you think that homeschooling is going to become illegal? Well, the answer to that is, I don't know, but are people going to try? You betcha. They're absolutely going to try. And so more than anything else, if you're homeschooling in the state of Oregon, for example, you want to join the Oregon a Coalition for Home Educators. You want to join Ocean Network. If you're in Indiana, find your state organization and you can find them. Actually, they're listed, many of them, at HSLDA. So if you go to the Homeschool Legal Defense Association's website and just click on your state You can very quickly find out what your state organization is and then get behind it because these people are the front lines for defending homeschool freedom. And so, for example, if the state legislature uh, in Indiana so much as sneezes in the direction of taking away freedom from homeschoolers, IAHE is going to have your back. These are the ones who are keeping their finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, legislatively as it relates to homeschool freedom. So I want you guys to really check that out. Find out what your state organization is and then become a member. And for the love of all things, stop taking government money for private home education. The government's not here to help you. They should be, but they're not. And so remember, and keep in mind, you guys, I think we've forgotten what the role of government is. The role of government is not to provide for you. It's not to give you food stamps. The role of government really is to protect your liberty and to protect your right Uh, as defined in our Constitution, and they're failing at that miserably, and they fail even more miserably once you start giving them money uh, because they've forgotten their jurisdiction. They don't understand what their role is anymore. And the minute we start taking government money and we start saying, you know, oh, government, please support me, please, please provide for my every need. Bam. Now we're now we're socialists. And really, that's where we're headed. So that's my little encouragement for you guys for today. I got a letter And I want to just take a couple of minutes today and talk about this. So Jennifer in Maryland was asking if I would do a podcast on 501c3s. And I thought about this for a while because I think what's going to happen is I'm going to talk about this and I'm definitely going to step on some toes. And so I guess I would I want to preface this by saying I am not uh, anti-501c3s for churches. But I am becoming that way. <laughs> let me just let me just tell you why. For many, many years, my husband and I have worked in churches up and down the Pacific Northwest. Jay was a worship pastor, many of you know, for over 20 years. Our lives have been dedicated to full-time ministry. We currently are running our nonprofit organization, Firmly Planted Family, and we have been dedicated to speaking the truth to the culture, to believing that the Bible has the answers to the to everything that we're struggling with. The Bible says everything that pertains to life and godliness, the Bible has the answers to. Uh, the Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. It's the Bible that tells us what marriage is. It's the Bible that outlines 
um, how we will flourish sexually as human beings. It's the Bible that explains where we came from and where we where we're going. Uh, it's God's word that has the answers to everything that all the struggles that we're facing uh, in this world. We can find the answers to in the Bible. It's the reason why. I started um, Faith That Speaks, which is previously known as Mom Strong International. It's the reason I write books. It's the reason that the nonprofit organization has turned its attention to planting homeschool resource centers because we recognize that the culture is literally lying to our children. And it's not subversive anymore. It's not being, uh, it's not hid behind um, sort of soft agendas. These are very hard agendas and they're out there in front of our children. And so what is our responsibility as believers? Well, the Bible says very clearly, we are the salt of the earth. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light on a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they might see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Ephesians 5, 8 says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. So walk like it. You guys, we're supposed to walk like it. We are supposed to walk like children of the light. So what does that look like? If you know Jesus, you have inside of you what the whole world's looking for. You have hope, the hope of heaven. You have the, uh, the, the light of the world. The Holy Spirit resides inside of you. Colossians 4 verse 6 tells you exactly what to do with that Holy Spirit power inside of you. Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you would know how to answer each person. The Bible never says there are subjects that are off limits for the church. And this is my this is my really big grievance with so much of what I see happening in our modern day churches. And this is simply what it is. Churches seem to care more. To my, from what I'm understanding, churches seem to care more about money than they do about truth. And here's how you can tell if your church is bending to the pressure or the benefit, rather, of, of being a 501c3. For those of you who are confused as to what a 501c3 is, a 501c3 status is a federal tax exempt status, and it's granted to qualifying nonprofit organizations, including churches and religious organizations. So, for example, Firmly Planted Family, which my husband and I founded nearly 24 years ago, is a 501c3. And the main reason any church would want to become a 501c3 is so that the church can operate without paying federal income tax on their revenue. And this allows donors to give money to the church. In other words, hello, tithing. So if you want to be considered tax exempt, if you want a 501c3, then the church has to meet certain criteria, which of course the IRS has established This includes being organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes, not engaging in the lobbying or political campaign activities of candidates. So other than that, there's no requirement for churches to obtain a 501c3 status, but it does give a whole lot of benefits. Some of the benefits are obvious, right? The tax exempt status, you can get tax deductible donations, you're exempt from state tax. You can get exemptions from federal unemployment tax and tax exempt financing for reduced postal rates. In other words, churches with a 501c3 status can also be eligible for tax exempt financing, which helps the organization save money and and on interest and other fees, as well as being eligible for reduced postal rates. So there's a lot of benefit in a church trying to become a 501c3. But here's the problem. What I have noticed is that churches, pastors in particular, hide behind that 501c3. So they say, hey, we can't do political campaigning. We cannot contribute or get involved in political campaigns. And that's true. Like, it's true that you can't give money to a political candidate. It's true that your church cannot endorse a political candidate. But guess what? You absolutely should be having the conversations at your church around political issues because political issues are by and large moral issues. These are moral issues and these are the issues of our day. And so, for example, uh, I told you that in my run for Congress, I we contacted over 200 churches to say, hey, 
I'm running for Congress. I'd love to just come and, and um, come to your women's tea. I'd love to stay, stand in the lobby after your church on Sunday and just meet people and greet people. That's absolutely permissible for a church that operates with a 501c3. But I heard over and over and over again from pastors or staff, or maybe the chairman of the elder board would call the campaign and say, hey, yeah, we just don't, we're a 501c3, so we don't engage in politics. And it blew me away because I was thinking, you know what that 501c3 stands for? That C stands for coward. Y'all are cowards. You're cowards when you won't engage in politics. And as I've heard you say uh, many times from the pulpit, we are called to be salt and light. And one of those arenas that we are called to be salt and light in is the political arena. And I'm going to keep saying this over and over and over again until some of you start talking to your pastors and say, hey, why aren't we hosting debates in our church? Why are we allowing the political candidates from every side of the spectrum to come in and talk about what it is they want to do, their vision for our county or their vision for our school board? We should be able to hear what they have to say. And when we don't do that, what we're really saying is we're hiding, right? We're just because it's it's so much easier to just not do it. It's so much easier to say, well, we just can't do that because we're a 501c3, the C standing for coward. And what you're really telling me is that you would hide behind a 501c3. You would prevent candidates from coming in and explain how they would govern your people for money. That's what you're saying. You're saying we're not going to engage. And the left loves this, by the way. Like you're, we're always hearing people talk about the separation of church and state, which, by the way, was a complete misnomer and misunderstanding of a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Church. And he was actually saying the opposite. He was saying that the church should be involved in the political discussions. And I'm, I'm down, right? Churches should not be uh, endorsing. But you know what? The endorsement should come from Scripture. Whatever's good, whatever's right. Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, whoever has the good reputation, the people of character, the men and women of character, character should matter. And we have elected people in this country from the smallest positions to the highest positions in the land who do not have integrity. They lack character. And we should be asking in the church, have a candidate come and say, tell us about uh, your, your, um, your religious beliefs. Are you a Christian? I sat on a stage and listened to somebody say uh, just last year that they were born a Christian. Listen, you're not born a Christian. If you think you were born a Christian, then you are definitely not a Christian. And what did that pastor say? The pastor was like, well, you've heard every single one of the candidates now, which frankly, I applaud this guy for allowing this to happen in his church. I'm very, very thankful. He is one of just a handful of pastors who would even dare to jump into the political fray. But it was interesting to note the fallout that happened after that, because so many Christians are like, I can't believe you had a political forum in your in your building. Uh, somebody else said to me, well, if you open it up to Republicans, you have to open it up to Democrats. So what? That's my that's my take on it. So what? Why can't we have that conversation? I love it when uh, I get to sit down with a leftist and he or she tells me why they support the murder and the dismemberment of unborn babies and babies up to 27 days old. I think that's a good discussion for church. That's a great discussion for God's people to hear. We should be able to have these conversations and churches should be there to facilitate them. And so when people ask me about, you know, should churches have a 501c3? What should we do going forward with our 501c3? Here's my sort of litmus test. If the 501c3 keeps you from telling the truth, by the way, I love what my friend uh, Jack Hibbs does every year. Every year he challenges the IRS to come and, and get him. He's like, come take away my 501c3 status because he knows they won't do it. And we have all of these pastors who refuse to engage in the issues of our day because they're worried that the IRS is going to come after them because ultimately they're worried about money. Ultimately, they're thinking, you know what? We, we won't get that tax write off anymore. And if your tax exempt status is keeping you from telling the truth, get rid of it. Get rid of it. If that's the thing, I'm sorry, but at Friendly Planet Family, I would so much rather not have the tax status. The day the government comes to me and says, you can't tell the truth anymore if you want to get money from the government, I'm going to be like, see you later. I don't need your money. I'll figure it out because I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Nothing is impossible for him. This should be the attitude of every person 
that is in ministry and is considering whether or not the 501c3 is for them. Because I have watched as these uh, these nonprofit organizations have literally had nooses hung around their necks through the process of getting a 501c3. And if you get onto the internet, if you start researching this for any length of time, you're going to see very quickly that people have differing opinions on whether or not churches should even have 501c3s. And uh, I think that there's going to be mm, probably a pretty big push to uh, to make it so that churches can't have these tax exempt statuses anymore. There's a lot of people who just think it's wrong, just you know that it's just wrong on its face. But I think that your church, and I, like I said, I don't have a problem if you are a 501c3 and you, and it's not affecting the way that you, that way that you engage with the public. If you're a 501c3 and it's not, a, and it's not changing the core mission of your church or keeping you from speaking truth in every sphere of influence, then I'm all for it. But for the most part, what I have noticed is that the 501c3 has been used very effectively to silence churches. Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. I'm going to read that again a little louder for those of you in the back. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Boy, you guys, if that's not a clarion call to God's people, I don't know what is. Expose them. You see transgender activists in your church, in your schools, expose them. You see people lying about whether or not men can become women and women can become men, expose them. You see people pushing pedophilia and sexual innuendo on children, expose them. This is the command to every believer from the word of God. Philippians 2.15 says that you, why should you do this? That you should be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. I, I don't have, you know, a, a thus saith the Lord on this, but my strong suspicion is that when 501c3s were granted to churches in the first place, the ultimate goal was to silence them. I think the ultimate goal was to keep them from saying the thing that they wanted to say for fear that they might lose their tax-exempt status and have to start paying property taxes again. That's really what I think. And it's time for us to start looking very carefully at what we are doing in the culture, in our neighborhoods, and ask ourselves very important questions about our role in the culture. And you guys have heard me say, I say it every day here at the show, you know, I'll see you guys at the intersection of faith and culture. That's where every Christian should be. We should be right there at the intersection of faith and culture having the hard conversations, teaching our kids how to engage with the world around them in a way that is both gracious and good. Jesus in John 8, 12 said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When I look at Jesus saying this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I really believe that if God's people would have the light of life in them. And that is the life abundant that Jesus said he came to give. Jesus said that the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. And we are seeing it in every sphere of the culture right now. Yesterday, I was talking to you guys about the pride parades and moms taking little kids to drag queen story hours and all manner of wickedness that we are exposing our children to. And God says that our role in all of this is to expose what is evil. And if that's not the role of the church, I don't know what is. Our role as believers and the role of the church is to proclaim the gospel boldly and without apology. This was what the Apostle Paul said. He, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, for anyone who believe in it. And when, when Jesus comes into your life, you get set free. When Jesus comes into your life, you get uh, the blinders taken off and all of a sudden you can see what's happening around you for what it really is. When Jesus comes into your life, looking at raising children is different. When Jesus comes into your life, marriage is different. When Jesus comes into your life, education looks different because all of a sudden you realize that Jesus said that when a student is fully trained, he'll be like his teacher. Well, I don't know about you, but I know I'm my, I'm my child's teacher and that makes me want to be a better mother. 
It makes me want to be more like Jesus. That should be the attitude of every Christian on the face of the earth right now. To say, Father, help me be the salt and light that you would want me to be. And if your 501c3 tax-exempt status is keeping you from walking in right relationship with the Lord, if your pastor is refusing to talk about cultural issues, if he's hiding behind his tax-exempt status or your church elder boards, if you hear more about what you what might happen if you lose your 501c3 than you do about issues that are raging in the culture and now they're injuring our children, it's probably time to find a new church. If you're hiding behind your 501c3, remember this. The C in 501c3 stands for coward. It stands for coward. And the only way that we can redeem that is if the C begins again to stand for courage. Courage is contagious. Billy Graham said that when one man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. Courage is what is required in the culture right now. Jesus said that we should not be afraid to let our light shine before men so that they might see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. That's why we do what we do. We're not doing it for money. We're not doing it for a tax exempt status. We're not doing it for accolades or for human reward. We're doing it out of obedience to expose the deeds of darkness, to be the salt and light that God has asked us and called us to be, and to remember that we have an opportunity, not just an obligation, but an opportunity to bring hope and healing to a world that desperately needs it. And if you're listening to this today and your church is hiding behind the 501c3 and the three and the C stands for coward instead of for courage, it's time to have a serious conversation about your role in the culture and what God would have you do. Because at the end of the day, that is what really matters. You guys, we're just passing through. We're not going to be here very much longer. I think about what's going on here at the Homeschool Resource Center and all the things that drive my husband and myself and the, and the ministry and the passion of Firmly Planted Family. But at the end of the day, we serve at the pleasure of the King. We serve here for as long as the Lord of Heaven's army says, Jay and Heidi St. John, I want you to serve me in this capacity. That should be the heart cry of every believer. And we should never, ever, ever let money dictate whether or not we will walk this thing out in obedience. I want to thank you guys for writing into me. If you have a question that you would like addressed here at the show, I might just dedicate a whole show to it. You can get to me at HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I will see you back here again tomorrow with an extended podcast for podcast subscribers right here at the intersection of faith and culture.